let us give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's all greet each other. May we... So today's message is entitled The Rest Restoring Gospel. There's a Korean proverb that says, you get your food cup by the ox you trust. It's often used to describe the pain of betrayal, especially when you've been wronged by someone close to you. Betrayal is a common experience in human relationships, like being deceived by a trusted friend or lending money to someone you believed in only to lose everything. And when you make a choice, when you make a decision, you think that they'll take your side. But then if a something completely different comes, if the result is something completely different than what you imagined, then you go through another pain. This kind of pain, especially psychological suffering from betrayal, is among the most intense forms of human distress. No wonder betrayal is a recurring theme in movies and dramas, often portrayed as something that leads to anger, revenge, and ultimately the destruction of relationships and lives. This shows that betrayal is one of the most undesirable experiences in life. But in today's scripture, Mark 14, we see Jesus going through multiple acts of betrayal. Jesus came to this world in the flesh to resolve the unsolvable problem of Genesis 3. Mankind's disobedience to God's word, separation from Him, and enslavement to sin and Satan, and that was only bound to go to eternal suffering and eternal destruction. No matter how successful you are in the world, we see that you cannot be happy through the political figures, through the fav famous celebrities, we can, we can never be happy because we're separated from God. And those who live without God, mankind are not the same as animals. No matter how full they are, if their spirit is not satisfied, they're created to never be happy. and to set us free from this destiny. There is the method God ordained for our spiritual liberation, which was through the atoning sacrifice of the cross. He shed His blood to cleanse all human sin and open the way to meet God. That is the mystery of the cross. This death by crucifixion was the most painful death a human could experience at the time. As Jesus prepared to face his sacrificial death, he prayed with sweat and blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, and after prayer, he boldly walked the path of the cross, clearly realizing that it, it was the will of God. After finishing his prayer, Jesus said to his disciples, Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. At that moment, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a crowd sent by the Jewish leaders to arrest Jesus. Judas, who spent all aspects of life with Jesus for three years, betrayed him. Yet, it wasn't only Judas who betrayed Jesus. 
the other 11 disciples who spent all aspects of life with Jesus, they betrayed him as well. In verse 50, it says, And they all left him and fled. Imagine the pain Jesus must have felt when all his beloved disciples abandoned him. And in today's passage, Mark contrasts two of these disciples, Judas, who betrays Jesus, and Peter, who vowed never to deny him, but ultimately ran away. They're the same. Both men betrayed Jesus, though in different ways. However, their stories ended in vastly different outcomes. Humans in their flesh can make mistakes and they can fail. That is why we need Jesus Christ. You might say, I will never fail. I don't make mistakes. That's a lie. That can never happen. Even today, we can live in ways that grieve Jesus and we're weak beings. But that matters. But what matters most is what happens afterward. Will we walk the path to eternal destruction or turn back to the path of eternal life? As today's sermon title suggests, will we experience the gospel of restoration or not? Can we experience the gospel that can truly restore us? I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to have the evidence to experience the true power of the gospel that transcends our limitations and weaknesses through today's word. Point number one, Judas Iscariot, who ended in failure. Let's read verses 43 to 45. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. When he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. In this passage, Judas Iscariot plotted with the chief priests, scribes, and the elders to arrest Jesus. He told them that the man he kissed would be Jesus, and they could arrest him. In the end, he plays a key role in the arrest of Jesus by giving him a kiss of betrayal. So why did Judas betray Jesus? Simply put, it's because Judas didn't, re Judas didn't realize and believe that Jesus is the solver of all problems. He didn't recognize Jesus as the Christ. So he failed to see the spiritual essence of who Jesus was. So people go to church, but they cannot see the spiritual essence. They only look at people, and they cannot listen to the Word of God. So those who lose hold of the spiritual essence, we don't know when they will leave church. When they're busy, they don't come to church. When they have problems, they, won't, they don't come to church. So may, people may say that they have weak faith, but then they don't realize the spiritual essence. They've never experienced the spiritual world. They've never experienced the fulfillment of the word. That is why they come and go. And to those people, you must show them. You must show them the spiritual essence. 
Like many others in Israel, Judas expected a political messiah who would liberate them from Roman oppression. So he looked at Jesus as a political messiah who would liberate them from Roman oppression. But when he looked at Jesus, unexpected situations kept on coming and it was completely different than his thoughts. So he said, his, that's a lie and he's not real. So because Jesus didn't meet his expectations, Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And this same misunderstanding about Jesus still happens today. Many attend church but are like Judas, thinking Christianity is about good deeds, charity, or social work. These are good things and these are very important as well. And even the Christian programs, they invite people to give the give, give their testimony and they test they testify about their good deeds, their charity, but that is not the essence of Christianity. That is not the core of Christianity. There is no difference in this Christianity programs or Catholic or Buddhist program. They only talk about good deeds, charity, and social work. And even people who's not been to church for a long time, they ask us, why? how come Yewon Church don't do any good deeds? But then we do. We have NGO. We have UniWorld. And just because we don't use the word, we don't talk about it, does that mean that we don't do them? So church is not for that. So we do it as well. But then the essence of Christianity, so why do we go to church? Why, what is the gospel talking about? What did Jesus do? It's to give eternal life. It's the eternal life. So we live about 100 years. So don't you want to get eternal life? The eternal life. And that to give eternal life through Jesus Christ, that is the essence of the church. That is why we do missions. That is why we give all in, because there is eternal life. And that's why we call it the gospel, meaning the good news. So without this essential basis, attending church is no different from attending a Buddhist temple. It's the same as living a religious life. So if you don't... And for Judas, who did not have the correct spiritual start, his story ends in tragedy. In Matthew 27, After feeling remorse for his betrayal, Judas returns the silver and he throws it into the river and he hangs himself. So he hung himself. And because the tree was broken, he fell and he died because his stomach exploded. What must we see here is the essential reason why Judas Iscariot's life ended in such failure. It was because he had a guilty conscience but no true repentance. So who never commits sin? So the reason why you fail is because not, is not because you made mistake but is because you didn't have true repentance. So what must we pray for every day? We must repent to God every day. Through the blood of the cross, may we wash, um, we believe that our sin 
is completely washed, and may we have that true repentance. So repentance is more than just realizing you've done wrong. It's about turning your life around completely. The Greek word for repentance, metanoeo, means to change one's mind and course of action. We must not just repent, but return to God. So Judas, he regretted and he had the suffering instead of repenting. He should have gone to God instead of going to the chief priest. Our faith must always be centered on God, not on ourselves. Is your thought correct? You say, in my thought, in my opinion, in my standard, in my experience, these are all self-centered. So, the Word of God, why do we come to church? Do you come to church, church to see somebody? That is religion. Do you come to church to work? That's religion. Why do you come to church? Through worship, you want to listen to the message to the Word that God gives you. So the Word that He is giving me. And worship is listening to the Word of God that He is giving you. And through the pulpit, you must hold on to the Word that God gives you. So if the worship ends without holding to the Word, then that's religion. And nothing remains. So are you coming to church as if you're going to a Buddhist temple? So when you give worship, just hold on to one word. So on Saturday night, pray. Pray to God, God, may, you, may I grab hold on to the word that you are giving me. And that's how you can save the church, save your surroundings. That means limiting my own thoughts and may I receive your word. May I be guided by the Holy Spirit. May I follow the word of God. So remember, a self-centered life leads to failure and eternal destruction. And changing my thoughts to God's thoughts, that's worship. So if what we should be looking at is suicide, and that's where it ends, there's no need for us to discuss this matter. However, Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, death is not the end. People, mankind are spiritual beings. Their flesh becomes dirt. So you can burn the flesh. Who are you? You are spiritual beings. You are spiritual beings. So let's say if you had a plastic surgery, your face turns completely around, but then you cannot have plastic surgery on your spirit. So I'm a spiritual being. I have a spiritual being that has flesh. So may you meditate upon those. And your words and your life will be different. Your thoughts will be different. Your value will be different. So death is the end. So we must not live a life of regret like Judas but rather turn back to God. So come before God, then you'll live. 
He says to come to me. So when you come before God and give Him um, worship, then you live. That is the gospel. A walk of faith is living a life centered on God and not centered on me. All we need to do is live our walk of faith according to His Word. Chrysostom, the early church father and famous preacher who was called the Golden Mouth, said this, The root of all our problems is ignorance of the Scriptures. So all problems, all situations, it comes, they come because of the ignorance of the Scriptures. Because of the ignorance of the Scriptures. Because we don't properly understand the words of God, we stumble and make poor choices in the face of challenges. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. So the word of God is the lamp to my feet. So long ago, it was dark. The earth was dark. So His word is the lamp to my feet and the light on my path. So we must follow the word of God. But then you've been to church 30, 40 years, but you don't have the word of God. And you cannot explain, explain about Christ to the non-believers. So you've been to church for a long time, but because you don't have the Word in you, you cannot study the Bible with them. So the Word of God is the lamp to my feet and the light of my path. But then you're completely seized by your own thought. So do you think it's taking place? So, even if it seems foolish, follow the Word of God. And if you realize something through the worship and you follow the Word of God, then God will work through you, work upon you. So do not be deceived by your own thoughts. So you're here at the place of worship. The Holy Spirit is responsible for you. And that's how I lived. I just followed. I never had discussions. So how would my wife know? This, this, this word that God has given to me, I would just follow the word. Because God is responsible for my life. So why are you trying to discuss the word of God with somebody? Just hold on to God's word as a rema and follow his word. So if people look at me, they wouldn't understand. Because so suddenly I would go evangelize, I came to Seoul, but everything, all decisions came from the word of God. So why do you want to discuss and receive counseling? Everything is given in the time of worship. And because you're not receiving the grace of God, and because you can't realize it on your own, so may you make good choices. May all believers of Yewon Church follow the word of God proclaimed on the pulpit and become people of faith who enlarge the tent of their physical and spiritual lives. Point number two, Peter who went on the path of restoration. Read verses 46 to 47. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by I drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. When Judas Iscariot kisses Jesus in betrayal, 
the group that came with him, grabs his hands and tries to arrest him. At this moment, one of the disciples drew a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. And that, was, that disciple was Peter. So Peter always make obstructive decisions. Peter was a man of many sides. It is said of him that he was like the Sea of Galilee. So you don't know when the strong wind will come. So I've been to the Sea of Galilee myself, and the sudden wave came. And I realized oh, Peter was like the Sea of Galilee. This is because the Sea of Galilee is a place that can be calm one moment and a furious storm the next. Peter was one of the disciples who was unpredictable and proud of himself for his loyalty to Jesus. But when Jesus is arrested, Peter, like the other disciples, flees. And in verse 66 onwards, he denies, he denies Jesus three times despite his confession that he would not betray him even to death. Jesus is taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, and put on informal and illegal trial by the Sanhedrin, the highest judicial, judicial body of the Jews at the time. And during that moment, Peter was watching from a distance, and suddenly one of the high priest's female servants comes out and tells Peter that he is one who was with Jesus, and he denies it. And she tells the others who are present, and Peter denies it again. And finally, when he tells those present that he was with Jesus, so I'm certain that he was with Jesus. And Peter cursed Jesus, and he sweared, he swore, denying Jesus. And it was about 20 meters long. So the places were about 20 meters long. So Peter made eye contact with Jesus, who was 20 meters away. So he was cursing and denying and swearing. And it was a complete betrayal. Despite having made the greatest confession of his life, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He cowardly denies Jesus in front of a powerless servant. So Peter was, un Peter was spiritually unhinged. Jesus had told him to stay awake and pray, but he couldn't. So you must realize that if you are not awake and praying when you should be, you will fall into a spiritually numb state. So in the world, you'll be really sensitive, but then spiritually, you're, you're in a numb state. So you cannot receive grace because you're spiritually numb. Even when you listen to the Word of God, even when you praise, you don't have any senses. Unfortunately, unlike Judas Iscariot, Peter returns to the road of restoration. Read verse 72. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter denied Jesus and even cursed him, but he wept, repented, and turned around. 
Matthew 26, 75 says that he wept bitterly. Peter thought about Jesus' word and shed tears of penitence. It was a moment of self-realization. So the self-centered life, the self-pride, and that is arrogance. You say, I will never be like that, but you're a weak being. How can you be so sure? So thinking that you can do things with your own power, that's called humanistic life. So those who are educated, those who are successful in the worldly eyes, that is why Jesus had called the fishermen of Galilee. That is why in church you can barely see famous people because we're all men of Galilee. So in the worldly standards, it may look like you cannot do anything. So you don't need any power because there is Almighty God. That's what God desires. So there is no one who has good backgrounds. That's not what, what God desires. So let's say you went to Harvard or Seoul National University, but then you don't have Christ. So this man is so great. How is he like that? Because he has Christ. That's what the Bible wants. So the humanistic life must be broken down. Why don't you receive answer? That's because you have so many thoughts, so many concerns. Because you believe in yourself so much. So I can't do anything. I am a sinner. Without the power of God, I cannot live. So I am a being that needs Jesus Christ. That's why the life of Galatians 2.20 is so important. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in the, in, you can live by the faith in the Son of God. So it is important for me to die and be crucified and only the fullness of Christ, only Jesus, always Jesus, perfect Jesus, eternal Jesus, be my nature. So only Jesus, only Jesus, only Christ. So Peter, whose ego was broken through repentance, was subsequently healed by the resurrected Jesus and was used as a gospel evangelist until he was martyred upside down on the cross. So all of his disciples were like that. And there was not one betrayal, betrayer in the Mark's upper room. So Jesus, he was martyred upside down on the cross because he said, how can I die like Jesus? So until the end, he relayed the gospel. He shared the gospel. And he, martyred, he was martyred upside down on the cross. So believers, what you're in the past is not important. Right now and going forth is important. In Luke 22, 61, we see that Jesus was watching Peter even while Peter was denying him. So Jesus knows our weaknesses and keeps and protects us. So to be with us and to protect us. And just like the eyeball for 24 hours, he's protecting us. May you believe in that. 
Believe and be empowered that the Holy Spirit within you knows your weaknesses and is praying with groanings that cannot be uttered. So someone is praying for you. Who is praying for you? The Holy Spirit is praying for me with groanings that cannot be uttered. I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to experience these spiritual mysteries of 24, 25, and eternity and live a strong and vibrant walk of faith like an eagle soars on its wings. So in conclusion, there's a film called Oppenheimer. So Oppenheimer was the chief scientist who played a key role in the creation of the atomic bomb in the U.S. So, so there was a, so he led a project with some of the top scientists of the time to develop a nuclear weapon before the Nazis and eventually developed a bomb. So imagine if Hitler made the atomic bomb first. It wouldn't be a chaos. It would have been a chaos. So in three years, he developed the bomb. And after he developed the bomb, Hitler committed suicide. So the bomb was never used. But then, however, when Japan continued to resist. The bombs were dropped in on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Japan surrendered immediately. The destructive power of the bomb was so great that Japan surrendered immediately. The first bomb that detonated 570 meters above Hiroshima destroyed 70% of the city and killed 140,000 people. The subsequent drop in Nagasaki killed 70,000 people, and survivors suffered fatal burns and were exposed to radiation. The radiation from the atomic bomb penetrates deep into the body and destroys It destroys cells after just one exposure, and the genetic disorders caused by radiation can be passed on to the future generations, creating terrible situation. So that's what an atomic bomb is. So why do I say this? So suppose a single exposure to the radiation of man-made atomic bomb is powerful enough to have lasting effects not only on the person who is exposed but also on his descendants. So what amazing changes will take place in a person and his descendants who are exposed to the light of the gospel? The spiritual radiation that comes not from the hand or wisdom of man but from the wisdom of the Almighty Creator God. This spiritual radiation, this spiritual light, will, when it shines upon me, it will sh shine upon all my descendants. So Satan knows this spiritual fact all too well. And that is why he's so diligently working to prevent the radiance of the gospel. So this holy radiation, so he's trying his best to prevent this spiritual radiation from reaching unbelievers. And at this time, he's doing that right now. So the Apostle Paul makes this very clear in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers 
to keep them seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So in order to prevent you from believing that Jesus is the Christ, the solver of all problems, He's distracting you. Believers, an atomic bomb destroys human life. But the light of the gospel is a light of life that fully restores our life. So who should, who should shine this radiation, this light of the gospel? That is the reason for our existence. The reason for our existence is not only to receive this radiance of the gospel, but also to shine it. That is the existence of the church of ourselves. So what should we live for? So first seek His kingdom and His righteousness and shine this light of the gospel. So may all of you live the life of an evangelist. I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to be absolute disciples of Christ who shine the radiance of the glorious gospel of Christ upon regions peoples and 237 nations and 5,000 tribes just like how Jesus commanded and that's what he's commanding us so may all of you become absolute disciples of Christ let us pray dear Father God may our believers realize that gospel has the power to completely restore us when they're at church may they only receive and hold on to the living word of God and may they become witnesses of the word of God so that so that they may realize that all of their problems are within the word of God may they experience the light and the spiritual radiation of Christ and may they shine this light and radiation of Christ to other people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.